Hi, welcome to A Watchman's Journal. I'm Diana Larkin, and I am welcoming back today John Redenbow of Dream Life Decoded and Ash West, a major prophetic dreamer. <laughs> we are, this is actually part two of his dream of who's at the door. And I'm going to have Ash just quickly summarize the first part because second scene is very different, but you need the first scene as well. And before you do that, just like, welcome guys. Thank you so much for coming on again with me. So it's a pleasure to always be here with you guys and good to see you again, Ash. Good to see all of you guys. Uh, it is, it's an honor and it's a blessing. And um, this is going to be special. It has been already. So, <laughs> Well, it has been, I should mention that we were supposed to start this meeting, this recording an hour ago. And it's just like, God is so on the move and he's doing such amazing, exciting and wonderful things that we we just couldn't stop talking. <laughs> we wish really that we would have recorded it because some really valuable things were said, but um, this will be good too. And we'll just keep coming back as long as the Holy Spirit is quickening us to come and share with all of you, our very much appreciated audience who comes and listens and leaves um, just really encouraging comments. So we appreciate all of you. So, all right, Ash, I'll give you the floor. You just give us a summary of that first part of your dream. I will do. So again, the date I received this was on the 4th of the 1st this year at 8.45 PM at my parents' house. I'm gonna run over it very, very quickly. I see a man with very short hair and wearing thin framed glasses standing inside a house looking out of a little window at the top of the front door. The door looks really weak and feeble. It is night outside. The man has, brown glass, has a brown glass bottle in his left hand. The man is talking to himself while looking outside, says they think they are coming in. They got another thing coming. He sounded like he was ready to fight. There is a flash of lights that comes through the top window of the door like a passing car with its headlights driving past. The man then sits on the floor with his back against the door. He takes a swig of his bottle and then pulls out a pistol from his right pocket. He is wearing grey shorts. There is now a bang at the door. The door continues to bang two or three more times. Then the man shouts, you better leave or you are going to get a real surprise. The man then makes an extremely, uh, sorry, the door then makes an extremely loud bang then starts to break at the top with a hand that can start to be seen. The, ma the man, still sat on the floor, turns towards the door and fires a couple of shots through the door, then stands up, drops the bottle and it smashes. He then leans against it with his left shoulder and points with his right hand the pistol through the broken wood and angles it towards the head of the person outside. He then says, try breaking this and fires another shot. Suddenly, a hand breaks through the door and grabs the man by his left shoulder and shouts in a concerned way, I am your pastor. Hmm. The man stops, takes one step back and opens the door. He then sits on the floor and says, look at the mess. You didn't have to break my door down. The pastor looks at him and says, I'll clean it up. So that was the first part of the dream. So we All are right. now on part Number yes. Two. And John, just give us a quick you, what you thought that first uh, scene was speaking to us. I feel like, thank you, Diana. Great dream, Ash. This is just incredible. I feel like it's um, specifically dealing with people who've been hurt by particularly leadership in the church and they've isolated themselves and they're medicating in some way or another. It doesn't have to be alcohol or drugs. It could be um movies could be food it could be isolation um it could be music it could be any number of things it doesn't have to be one of the vices like alcohol but it's the idea that they're looking for uh what i hear as a witness in their life um to be able to uh kind of justify why they've isolated themselves and there's something about the bottle in particular that i think has to do with i believe there's a clear bottle in the second part of the dream. And there's a juxtaposition between the brown and the clear. And, but anyway, this is, again, it it's, it's about the idea and it's kind of a base level 
kind of a like, well, duh, anybody can see the level that there's people that have been hurt by pastors that need to be reached. And the idea of firing into the door, the idea of poor boundaries, the idea of addiction, hopelessness, um, and even the idea of those in the church and those who are pastors who are frustrated because they've reached out and they've literally taken hits. They've been shot at. They've been pushed away. They've been, you know, nobody's come to the door and they're out there trying to do their jobs to save people, to rescue people. Not that it's their job to do that, but that it, it is their job to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to help the hurting. And they're trying to do that. And they're frustrated because of the weight of the drama of what's happened before and the preconceived notions in certain people's minds related to trauma that we could just classify under church hurt. It's bigger than that, but it can be father wounds. It can be all kinds of things and a real need for God to want to enter in. We talked last week about the revelations three twenty. behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice, I will come in and sup with him. And so the idea of coming in and sharing and communion and literally the idea of coming in and grabbing somebody, it's going to be okay. And then saying, how do I clean up my life? How do I clean up this mess? You know, and you didn't have to break the door down. You didn't have to be so forceful. Well, I never would have gotten in if you didn't break the door down and you were shooting at me. And so I think we can find ourselves on either side or both sides of that equation. You know, how are we treating those in authority in our life, maybe even accountability partners? Are we being truthful? Are we being honest? Are we letting them in? Or are we saying, no, this you're not going to come into this area of my life? And I feel like a lot of this is punctuated by some of the recent things that we've seen in the church related to uh, pastors and prophets and clergy and people in high positions yeah. falling. And I think, um, though it's not, it's, it's, I'm not trying to solve the problem of every leader that's that's made mistakes or has flat out been a wolf in sheep's clothing. But I am saying that letting people in your life and being real and accountable is probably the first step in removing a lot of the trauma that's uh, of hurting people, whether they're on the leadership side or they're on the um, congregant side, for lack of a better term. They're all part of the body of Christ, but that's 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 what I see. I feel like it has a level that goes into uh, the national tenor of what we're seeing here in America, not just America, what we're seeing in Europa, what we're seeing in Europe, what we're seeing with broken down borders and, and, and different things like that, not in the sense of coming in to help, but in the sense of poor boundaries, of um, offense, of preconceived notions about people. Uh, entering things like that. I think there's a lot here. There's a lot of mess in our world today in the church and in the political system that God wants to be invited into and he wants to help change and clean up. That's good. That's great. I I would just add that I feel like this is a picture of a true shepherd. This yes. is one who is going to any lengths to reach that wounded hurting one. And he's going to say, I'm going to walk you through this. I'm going to help you clean up this mess. So that's the heart leaves of the, the 99. Shepherd. Yeah. Leaves the 99, mm. dodges the gunfire and goes after the one. Yeah. <laughs> that might be the amplified edition <laughs> yeah. or the message version. <laughs> but, yeah. The modern yeah. graphic amplified. Yeah. Right. The, the Ash West dream illustrated version. <laughs> Did you get the copy of this dream, John? I, I put it in the email. Okay, yeah. good. Um, all right. Well, Ash, let's have you go on and share scene two in this stream. Okay. Here we go. I am in my parents' house, and there is a, a group of people there I have never met, sat in, a, in the lounge. They say they are Christians, yet not once do they mention Jesus, God, or the Holy Spirit, as they talk amongst themselves and me. They only talk to me when offering or giving me a drink. It is always in a plastic clear bottle. It is always given or offered by the same man. He looks like a pastor, but I do not trust him. He gives me another bottle and says, drink this. I take the bottle, then say, I'm going to, I'm going to the bathroom. 
then get up and go upstairs. As I go to the bathroom, I open the bottle and I know it's poisoned. I pour the bottle in the toilet and then go to my bedroom. I then hear the pastor and the group of people talking to one another while they are tidying the house. The pastor says, his dad is dead. I now have a revelation that my dad is not coming back as I'm sat at the top of the stairs. A date then comes into view, 08 NOV. I then start to weep and cry in a screeching, long, drawn out way that my soul felt it was getting thinner and thinner. Dad, dad, dad. And that's the end of the dream. This was a highly emotional dream for you, wasn't it, Ash? Wow. Yeah. Uh, even going back to that now, it's, it's funny. The first time I read this through, and again, it's just by the grace of the Lord, um, I didn't have the emotional aspect to it. But now, just reading it now, it's taken quite a lot of me to hold back the tears coming back again. But I'm not looking through it as a, as a personal thing anymore. Right. Right. I'm not. I'm looking through it as this is about the body. This is about the children of God. And I know we were just mentioning this before we hit the record button in regards to children of God. Um, and it is, it's almost like I'm it's like turned it around. Like I'm seeing through the father's heart, seeing this lie being told to his children. And that's what's really hurting me. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave it to you guys. All right, John, tell us your thoughts. <laughs> well, I think I think there's a lot here. Um, I'm really intrigued by the date. I'm actually looking just to see if there's anything that um, I feel like the date is something we're probably going to have to research. OK, uh, but I'm just wondering if there's anything that shows up, particularly in 2024 or, of course, and you had the stream last year, 2023. No, I had this uh, this year on the 4th. Oh, yeah. January, January 4th. 4th. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then the other date in the dream is November 8th. Yeah. November 8th. That's what I'm wondering is what yeah. happened November 8th or what is going to happen yeah. November 8th. Yeah. Which it's is um, funny because it's 08 NOV. It's not spelling November. And it's yeah, not, I, a, yeah. there's not a, right zero like it's not done in numbers either so interesting 1701 was the charter of privileges by william penn first library in 1731 benjamin franklin opened the first library which i think is interesting because god used benjamin franklin as a picture to get me here to where i live um mm -hmm. so i think that's mm -hmm. Lincoln's second term. He was elected in 1864 to his second term. Wow. That might be it. There's a lot of comparisons second between term. Lincoln and <laughs> Trump. And uh, 1864, November 8th, he was elected to his second term. And that was on November 8th. November 8th. You know, there was a a a a, a prophet, a, a prophetic guy had had a dream. I believe it was a dream back. Um, I think this was pre. This might have been twenty twenty. I think it was twenty twenty because I, I remember uh, JFK defeats Nixon in nineteen sixty. I think that's interesting too. Um, but he had a dream about Trump walking into the Oval Office and he walked in like behind him or something. And Trump was looking, I believe, in the mirror. And this person in the dream saw Trump, but he also, I believe he saw Lincoln looking back at him through the mirror. Had either of you heard of this? No. Yes. Yes, I do remember. I don't remember who shared it, but... I do remember that. 
Yeah, I think it's it's interesting um, because what is clear to me or seems to be clear to me, Trump defeated Clinton in 2016 on the 8th. Uh, hello. Oh, I like that. <laughs> So, so you're tough. saying that this dream, because it's 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 a second scene, I think it does address the church as well. But yeah. I do think we can put a broader umbrella and put it around a sick nation as well. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's exactly what I'm feeling is what 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 is, uh, you know, and it's not all about politics. It's not all about Trump, but it's not all about the church either. But what I was really um, gripped with, and and I think the emotional part for you too, is the cry of this generation for fatherhood. Yes. Dad, dad, dad. Yes. And the idea that the dad yeah. is dead is the announcement. And it's the idea of, um, it's everything from father wounds to rejection from fathers to living in a lawless state where things are not enforced, where law enforcement is not allowed to do their job, where people are are running wild and, and tearing things down and lighting fires and doing all this stuff. And then when even people who have been harmed are going to the court system and they're not getting any level of justice, um, I think this is a cry of this generation for fatherhood. Um, but in this dream... This other dream, and and by the way, this is this is just kind of a default because we look at so many dreams. Part of what we do is we look for trends. A lot of times, somebody will share a dream, and it'll remind me of two or three other dreams. And <laughs> it's not to di divert from the importance of this dream, but it's to add value to the fact that God will say something through two or three witnesses. Uh, what's really interesting is in this dream, Trump's looking in a mirror. What's looking back is Trump and Abraham Lincoln. What I don't think this dreamer understood, um, at least wasn't mentioned when he shared the dream, was the idea that if you don't know, Trump is his, or I'm, I'm sorry, Lincoln is historically the most prolific presidential dreamer that we know of in history. There's more Lincoln dreams than there are anybody else dreams that we've ever seen. And I've looked, we spent a lot of hours looking at various presidents and reading biographies and, and things like that. And what's really interesting is I have a book from 1865, which was the year Lincoln died, was killed. And it's written by his best friend, who was also his bodyguard. And so this is a first person account written the year Lincoln passed away. And I, I have a copy of it. And there's an entire chapter on dreams visions and apparitions so this falls under visions and apparitions and the story goes like this it was in lincoln's first term he went home or went up to it must have been in the white house the residence and he stretched out on a couch and as he was stretched out on the couch he happened to glance over at the bureau and at his bureau there was one of those tilted mirrors and when he looked at the mirror he saw himself stretched out on the couch but he also saw a double image of just his face. And he was like, the heck is that? So of course he got up and he went over to the mirror and it was like, you know, was it the sunlight? Was it this? Was it that? You know, laid back down, saw it again. There's him laid out on the couch that he sees the reflection of himself in the mirror. But then right beside it is his face. And he noticed he had a little less hair. He looked grayer. He looked more gaunt. He was like, man, I, I don't look good. And it was not like he looked then, but it was like, man, what, what is that? And so as you can imagine, it troubled him. And then he got called to a meeting. He came back after the meeting. He tried, he was able to reenact it one more time. And then he tried numerous times after that to show, you know, Mary Todd to show his wife and all of this. And he was like, I don't know what the heck that was, but he couldn't figure out where the double reflection came from. And in telling his wife, his wife said this to him. Um, his wife said, because there were two reflections of you, I think it means you're going to have not one, but two terms, which of course we know to be true. Hmm. And then she also said, be careful what you say. She said, because the picture was more gaunt and it looked more, you were thinner and you had less hair, you looked bad. Uh, I feel like it's a premonition that you're going to die during your second term. Yeah. Wow. And he did. Yeah. 
Wow. And so when somebody has a picture in a dream that they're walking into the White House and they see Trump looking at a mirror and what's looking back is Trump and the face of Lincoln. Holy cow, dude. Like, do you have any idea the significance historically? Well, most people don't study the dreams of presidents, so they don't. But I'm just like freaking out when I mm. saw this dream. Like, <laughs> now what they didn't see is they didn't see two Trumps. And they didn't see Trump looking back. It's not an exact replay, but if you don't even understand the context, which again, unless you study the dreams of presidents, you wouldn't even know that this happened. <laughs> it's like, what in the heck is God saying? So there's multiple things he could be saying. One is that people can interpret that as Trump will get a second term. They can also interpret that as Trump being like Lincoln. And there are others who might want to, kind of think in a negative way and think that, well, right. Don't go to Ford's theater anytime soon, buddy. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and that's not where I see this going because no. again, if you look at the pattern, the pattern was he saw the reflection of himself. So what I do believe it it is confirming is that part of who, who Trump is, is he's Lincoln esque. Now, there's a whole lot of people that aren't going to like that statement. And, and I would suggest to those people that perhaps you have a bias about Trump that you need to prayerfully take to the father and you need to ask God, God, what do you say of this person? Because what the media said has categorically been wrong almost across the board, almost in everything they've said from Russia collusion to racism, to this, to mm -hmm. that, to mm -hmm. narcissism mm -hmm. and yep. this. And yep. like, I'm not defending the man. The man's record stands on its own. Mm -hmm. But I would challenge you, if you have a hard time with President Trump, you need to go mm -hmm. back and you need to look and you need to pray and say, God, I want to hear what you have to say from this man, because People, God is not schizophrenic. And we saw this in the 2020 thing where prophets said he's going to get a second term and then he didn't or it didn't appear that he did. And then the office of the president, select or whatever media stuff they made up to try to ram it down our throats. And mm -hmm. did we go back and do an audit? Should we have? Should we not have? There's been people with more of a background in history and election stuff than me that have been discussing that for the last four years. I'm not wading into that discussion. What I am saying is God is not schizophrenic. And so if you went back on, well, this or that, what's interesting, again, is that the dreams never wavered one time. Yeah. And we've even gone back and done studies after the inauguration of, of Biden and said, okay, God, are you saying something different? Did your plan get derailed? Was there, <laughs> so did the enemy slip one bias? And now you have, no, 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 and no. And so we see multiple dreams of things like Trump coming back. And I think we need to be prepared for the possibility. Guys, I'm okay being right. I take no pride in having to be right. Yeah. So I'm not selling any books on what I think, you know, the Trump <laughs> prophecy is or doing any, like if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And if I am wrong, we're going to go back and we're going to do a postmortem, me and my entire mm -hmm. team. Mm -hmm. And we're going to look at the body of work and we're going to say, God, what you, what, what were you saying? But I also do feel the need to let people know that if you believed and if you felt that God has told you two terms, mm -hmm. um, we've gotten that 50 times possibly. Mm -hmm. Um, plus, um, and it, there's not a lot that's in conflict with that. It's not like we're getting mixed messages. <laughs> the messages really aren't mixed. <laughs> now, again, we haven't been really vocal on this because, you know, what we do is we work in, in intelligence and in intelligence, frankly, you don't shoot your mouth off about everything, yeah. you know? Right. And so sometimes God wants to keep a secret and he wants mm -hmm. to share it with people that he trusts. And it's not really for everybody. It's really for a select few. God may be telling me something, or he may be telling leaders that we serve with the mm -hmm. information that God shares with us. Um, yeah. But I just think it's really interesting that <laughs> there's a cry of this generation for a father. Now, again, if, mm -hmm. if me saying, and, and I feel like I, uh, uh, this is not where I was going to go with this, Diana, at all. But I feel like God is is 
There's a heart wound that America has, I believe, related to fatherhood. Yes. That Trump triggers every single day of the week and twice on Sunday. <laughs> and so there's a whole lot of people who will not allow themselves to even consider the possibility that Trump may not only be a good president, may be the president that we need in this time because he triggers things like even the hat, make America great again, even the red tie. People, oh, he's a narcissist. And he's, you know, perhaps there's something that happened to you. And I'm saying this generally to anybody, you know, don't get mad at me. I don't know you. I don't know your life. So if you feel triggered, it's not my fault. But perhaps there's something that has happened to you that God wants to reach into your heart and fix. And he wants to fix that because he wants you to have a closer relationship with him. And I'm going to share something that hopefully doesn't get me into trouble. Um, but because I feel like it's sometimes people are confronted with a truth that they can't dodge. And I call it hitting the brick wall. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we need to hit the brick wall mm -hmm. in order for God to be able to break through. As many of you know, God gave me a revelation years ago that I fought four years against, which is the idea that all dreams come from God. And I, I looked it up in scripture for two years, studied every verse on dreams, every dream in the Bible, looking for where's the demonic dreams, where's the soul dreams. Guess what? There's none of either anywhere in scripture. And there's no verse that says that those things are even possible, despite numerous amounts of people and pastors and leaders and theologians who have tried to argue this point with me. Again, I argued it with myself for two years and looked at every <laughs> single thing. There's no proof. So then I'm like, okay, well, if I can't prove it with scripture, then I'm going to prove it experientially. So when people would say, I got a dream, I'd say, I don't want to hear your dream. I want to hear the worst nightmare you've ever had in life. And so I spent about two years only not entertaining any conversations on dreams, Unless you're going to tell me the worst thing. Why? Because I wanted to find the exception to the rule where we could say, yeah, that's a demonic dream. There's no way, as people say all the time, there's no way God would give me that dream. And so when people ask for proof of that, and particularly as it relates to a father wound, the best example that I can give is the following example. Um <clears throat> I'm at a furniture store. A friend of mine is doing a, a class called the Advanced Prophetic Institute. It's in Redding, California. A lot of people really believe um, the grace-filled message of God and how God loves us and how he celebrates us and how, you know, a, a lot of things that not a lot of people believe, that God is joyful over us as his children. And I didn't know that I was going to speak this particular night. They just kind of said, hey, you're the dream guy. Can you get up and say a few things? And I'm like, I didn't prepare anything. What do I say? And God said, tell him that you believe dreams come from me. And I didn't realize that he was completely setting me up with this. But that's what happened. <laughs> and so they hand me the mic. And I didn't know, again, that I was speaking. And I just said, hi, I'm John. And um let me tell you why I believe that all dreams come from God. About literally 20 seconds in, boom, a hand goes up. Have I told you guys this story? I have heard you tell it, but it is fascinating to me. And it was a long time ago. Okay. Okay. So a hand goes up, a, a attractive lady in the front row about, I don't know, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever she was. She says this, I had a dream. I was raped by my father. You're telling me. God gave me that dream. Wow. You know, probably one of the best dream questions I've ever been asked, you know, because I'm just like, oh boy, there's nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah. There's like, nobody cares about your four year struggle, about what you found in scripture, about all your neat little nightmares. They want an answer to this question and nobody cares anything else you want to say until you answer this question. And I'm just like, God help. I don't have a clue. I don't what am I going to tell this lady? Yeah, God gave you a dream. I mean, what? And and I wasn't sure that I believed that statement that she said, you're telling me God gave me a dream that I was raped by my father. Well, everything in me resists that idea. Well, God is a good God and God doesn't want trauma. And God is this. And, but I spent four years proving the opposite. So now something, you know, we're hitting a brick wall. 
what do we do? And so I'm like, God, I, I don't know what to say. And he says, ask her how she felt. And I thought that has got to be the dumbest question anybody could ask a woman that's been through this or had a dream that she's been through. This. How did you feel? Like I, I'm like, God, you realize I'm still single, right? Like I'm gonna look like the biggest insensitive idiot that's ever talked to a woman in life. You know, and God's like, just ask her. And I'm like, so I did what we do when we maybe know that we're hearing God, but we don't want to admit it where I said, well, I'm okay with being wrong. And I don't always hear rightly. And this may not be blah, blah, blah. But here's, I just have to tell you what I'm hearing. And I'm hearing the question, how did you feel? Waiting for like the eggs and the tomatoes to come out from a mostly female crowd and hit me in the face. And none did. Um, but she goes, you know, I was really annoyed. What? That's not how I describe being a victim of this type of crime is being annoyed. And she said, yeah, I just wish he'd finish. I had stuff to do. What? I'm like, you're literally looking at your watch, like, hurry up. I have laundry. And I said it back to her just like that. And she said, yeah, pretty much. And so suddenly I realized, okay, there's no trauma that you would experience if you really experienced this. There's no level of, oh my gosh, I'm mortified or I'm full of rage or I want to kill this guy or the deepest betrayal of my entire life. All the things that you would think you would experience when going through this. And then I just heard this. I, I saw a vision just kind of in my mind's eye of her heart. And there was a black spot right here and the hand of God was moving towards it to heal it. And every time... He touched it. She went and she pulled away. And I'm like, okay, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> and God says, I want to heal her. But every time I get close to the wound, it feels to her like a violation or forced intimacy from the father. Wow. And I was like, well, I've never used those words in that context before. I said that to her. She bursts out sobbing. And she says, you're a hundred percent right. God's been trying to heal me. I know exactly what you're talking about. I know what area it is. Thank you. Basically it changed her life. Mm. And I'm sitting there like that worked. Like I was like the most surprised one in the room. Like really? <laughs> and everybody else in the room, there was like this quiet because everybody's processing like, wait a minute, did he just prove that God, a loving, gracious, honorable God, would give a woman this kind of a dream because he cared more about her heart and fixing trauma from her past than he did about being misunderstood by the presentation of the message. Wow. And this is where I learned that God doesn't have the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America. <laughs> <laughs> that looks at all of his dreams before he sends them to us. There's no, is that R? Is that NC-17? Is that PG? Like the other thing I learned about God is God is definitely into shock value. And you can prove this scripturally. Mm -hmm. If you begin to have like, if you just have an understanding of what the gods of Egypt meant and how bulls are considered in some sense, like a deity that embodies the Pharaoh and when he sees fat cows being eaten by skinny and gaunt cows, he might think this has to do with me and my reign, which is why he freaked out and couldn't go back to sleep. This wasn't a dream about cows. He's thinking this is about me. And then if you look at the dream of Abimelech, and then if you look at even the dreams of, of Daniel, like there's so much that God is in for shock value. Why? Because we remember it mm -hmm. and then we can be like, wow, this is, this is showing us something. What is this showing us? That's good, John. I really, um, I've wanted you to cover this subject because I do have people ask, you know, what about what we call nightmares, um, as scary dreams, we see something bad happen and we wake up and it's like, what do we do with that? I, I could tell you, dream after dream after dream, dreams of four-year-olds, dreams of mom whose kids were killed in the dream, uh, dreams of people committing suicide, people dismembered, people like rooms with kids' heads hanging on. I mean, the most horrific stuff that you, zombies, all kinds of stuff. 
every single one was a profound God dream. And a lot of times they touched on a very traumatic area of hurt okay. where somebody literally had Nazi zombies who were just shot an eight-year-old kid in the face. I mean, it's just like, are you kidding me? Like, what the heck? Where is God in this? And then <clears throat> for that one in particular, it was, there was a kind of like the last dream. There was kind of some topics in the last dream that were happening in this dream. They had caught his girlfriend and these Nazi zombies were just torturing her. And then this eight-year-old kid who is this guy's cousin comes out and one of the Nazi guys holds a gun to his eyeball and said, looks at the guy and says, you better tell me this. And the guy didn't know. And so he pulls the trigger and literally blows the head off this eight-year-old kid. And it's just like, what, what, what is this? But it's not real. So what is it? <clears throat> and as we're sitting there, it was like, well, how old was the kid? The kid was eight years old. And then somebody heard what happened to you when you were eight. Mm -hmm. And it was like, well, that was the first time I was assaulted in a particular way that a kid should never get assaulted in. Mm -hmm. And he had seen some of those things in the dream. And then the idea of literally having your mind blown and, you know, it was a play on words. It was a very, very graphic play on words. But as we begin to say, did anything happen to you when you were eight year old, years old? Yeah, this was the first time this happened. And then this and this. And it turned into like an hour and a half session praying for this guy as this guy opened up some horrible mm -hmm. things that he experienced traumatically as an eight year old kid that were kind of a play on words of Nazi zombies. And the Nazi zombie thing was like watching a movie like. There aren't Nazi zombies that are blowing the heads off of eight-year-old kids. Like it's just, it's not reality. But probably because it was too painful for God to show him the actual event, it had to be like, mm -hmm. I had this crazy dream. Let me tell you about this dream. Yeah. And there wasn't a lot of emotion attached to it other than he saw his cousin get killed in the dream. And so God will do that to begin to open up parts of our heart. And I feel like this goes back to, I know we've been talking kind of generally about the dream, and I want to get into some more specifics, if that's where you're okay to go, Diana. Yeah, I am too. And I was just going to remark about uh, seeing President Trump and um, Abraham Lincoln in the same mirror. Um, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves and Donald Trump is going to free the biggest group of slaves this world has ever seen that are caught up in, tra in trafficking. I mean, the estimates are 40 million people. So, um, yeah. And I believe that when that happens, um, I feel like it's going to usher in. The, the good news is, is I feel like it's going to usher in the third great awakening. Mm -hmm. What what people don't want to say, if you've ever studied revival in scripture, it's just like if you've studied an outpouring of finances, it's after a Great Depression. It's after people were brought so low that they were completely undone, that it's either God saves us or we all die here, and then mm -hmm. God saves us. So the good news is the Third Great Awakening. The bad news is what we have to go through. And God has been telling my group this for several years, <clears throat> and it's the idea, and I feel like this is the order. There may be some other steps in between. But I feel like one of the things that he's doing right now is he's shutting the mouth of the liars, which is the media. The media has lost pretty much all credibility at all. When you get a guy like Tucker Carlson who can beat every single rating there is, <clears throat> then and he's way more and and, and he has he has way more ratings than the traditional news sources, CNN, Fox, or all of them put together. And then when they're doing the mm -hmm. GOP debate and he's interviewing the president and he have 200 million views over here and maybe 14 million over there, like it's not even on the same planet. Like, I mean, it, I, I don't think we can estimate how bad the bleeding has been for mm -hmm. traditional media. I don't think Disney is the best example. And they came out a while ago and they said Disney lost 29 billion to which a lot of us were like 29 billion. How did they lose 29 billion? And then I realized, you know what the media does a lot is they lie to us. Let me look up how much Disney actually lost because what if they lost, lost more at the peak of their stock price, which I believe was the peak of the market cap is Disney. I believe it was March 4th or March 5th of 2021. 
to when I was looking, it was about midway through 2023. They lost $214 billion in two years time. Not 20 billion, 200 billion. Wow. So now I know why they put out there, oh, Disney lost 29 billion because people would say, oh yeah, well, we believe that. And oh my gosh, no, it's 10 times that what they lost and that's one company. And then if you begin to look at CNN and Fox and you look at the exits of major people and <clears throat> all of these things that are happening. So I believe what God is already showing us is shut the mouth of the liars. And again, you know, if you look at people, there have been people that have been given prophetic words that they need to take down Mockingbird. They need to pray against the Mockingbird spirit. You guys know what I'm talking about. You've all heard of this as well. And has that been completed? I don't know. I don't know that that's been completely done. I feel like a lot of that's been done, but there was also a dream that came back, cut off the heads of the giants. And the same person saw giants lay down on a battlefield and God told them to go cut the heads off. So the idea that mm -hmm. say the five media giants in America have certainly been bled um, and wounded and maybe laying down and potentially dying as far as corporations um, I don't think they've been beheaded. And so what does it mean to behead a giant or a spiritual entity? This is something we've been looked at for a while. But what I believe the will of God is, is for the mouth of the liars to be shut. Why? Because when exposure happens, which is next, it's already happening, but when it happens even more, and then sin is revealed, we can't have people gaslighting us and giving us an excuse to close our eyes and say, oh, that was all fake. And no. Mm -hmm. And there is coming a time when I believe, and, and this is the best way to say it, it's a little graphic, but I feel like it's almost like America is going to have her eyelids cut out or they're going to be glued open. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to look mm -hmm. at what we allowed to happen under our watch in our country by our own government and our own people on our own children. Yeah. And it is going to break the heart of America because these weren't these guys over here, or these people over here, or these untouchable people. Part of it was, but part of it was regular people. And this is what they did to our children in our schools, in our churches, in our institutions of government that said that they were there to protect. <clears throat> and I think that two things are going to happen. I think that there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be so angry they are going to want to literally use their hands and rip these institutions to the ground. They're going to be to the point of wanting to commit violence, frankly. They're going to be fathers that are angry that this happened, and, and they're not going to know what to do other than to go to that place of protecting, and that looks like one way. And then there's going to be other people that are going to be so depressed because they're going to be like... How can we overcome such evil? How can we look at this whole generation that has been abused, that have been through, like, how can we ever have hope? And God forbid, they'll be looking for bridges, literally, to jump off of. And I believe it's at that moment, and I don't want to prophesy that over our nation, but I believe the redemptive part is at that moment when people are <clears throat> undone and ready to handle it in the flesh or their hearts are broken to the point of hopelessness that they literally, for some people, seeing the movie The Sound of Freedom was that moment. And for those of us that know even the slightest little bit about what's really happening in America, that literally was a Disney story. Like all of it happened outside the United States. Everybody came home. Everybody was safe. None of what they're really doing to children. It's not just the sexual stuff. It's way, way worse. And there's a whole lot of people that haven't been woken up to those realities. And when they are, they're just, they're not going to be able to think of anything else. And again, that's when the spirit of God is going to come in because what's going to happen is we're going to be undone by the own sin of our land. And we won't be able to blame other people and look elsewhere. We're going to say the people that we elected, the pastors that we allowed to lead us, the people that we chose to trust, the doctors, the coaches, the this is what they're doing. And in a sense, it's partly our fault. And then we're going to be like, how do we ever recover? And that's when the spirit and the presence of God is going yes. to hit us. And that's part of this generation yes. crying out, dad, dad, dad. Yeah.
Oh, yes. Wow, that's really powerful, John. Um, I really uh, do witness to that. And that's <clears throat> when we, as the Army of Light, shine so that people are drawn because we're the ones with hope, we're the ones with the battle strategies, and we're the one with the promises of God. And we can say, no, come look. This is what's in the future for us. There is hope. There is there a is. way. Yeah. Yeah. It's that light being the light on the hill, isn't it? It's that reflection that you are the light in the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend yes. you. And because we will have, we do already. And this is why it's so imperative. It's so important that you get in the word, you spend time with the father because whether you see yourself as a leader, a prophet, an evangelist, a preacher, a teacher, a whoever, at the end of the day, you are all those things for yourself. But if you have a family that you're fighting for, you're contesting for, that are not mm -hmm. awake in this hour, like so many of us are, you are going to be that pastor. You're going to be that prophet, the evangelist, the, you know, the apostle. They're going to come to you. They're going to come to you because you have either planted those seeds or they've disagreed with you in the past. And when this breaking moment that John's just been speaking about yes. one way or the other, anger or despair, it's a breaking moment of your soul. Yeah. And when that happens, you're going to be the light. That is the only funny. We had a dream last night, John, that one of your um, people that come on was talking about a channel you're going to be the channel that they decided through the debris, through that dark water, the cold water, mm -hmm. you're going to be the channel that they're only going to be able to see in the darkness. You're going to be the dry land that they're going to be swimming towards in this flood that's going to come. And it is going to be like a flood of Noah's, Noah's time because during that time of Noah, all these atrocities, all and it was out in the open like it is now. And it's probably going to be a little bit more amplified before we get there. But it was out in the open and there was no care given to God. There was no care. And there was only eight people on the planet that God saw that were worthy of saving. Aren't we blessed that there's more than just eight of us here, brothers and sisters? <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are. And I, I will just say, too, that that cry of dad, dad, dad could also be those right now we are seeing spiritual leaders fall that people invested their lives in, that they built their faith with them as a foundation. And it has been ripped away from them and they are lost. They're broken. And that could go to political leaders as well, who are going to people we have respected and honored. And we're going to find out that they have been wearing a mask and that they have been selling us out. Um, so I think it is the cry of several generations that are going to be weeping for a father. They need a dad. And I've actually had words from the Lord that DJT is going to be a father to the nations. So you're not okay. the only one that's had that. Okay. There's been multiple dreams um, and visions that people have had. One I'll share because it was sent to me is, um, Basically, he's on his horse, Nelson, which was the gray kind of white horse and it's George Washington. And he's on a cliff overlooking a foggy valley, which, of course, is indicative of foggy bottom, which foggy bottom is where the State Department is. And people see that <laughs> a lot of that as the hotbed of the deep state. Right. The holdovers from previous administrations that are kind of doing their own thing, allegedly <clears throat> nothing against anybody that works for any institutions, but. If, if you're listening and you would do work for, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You could probably name names, but he's looking down and the, the fog clears a little bit and the whole valley is full of red coats. And somebody Whoa. sees him and points him out and they all turn and they all fire their flintlocks in his direction. Wow. And there's this big amount of smoke as this whole volley of gunfire goes off. And <clears throat> we're in the dream you still see the horse nelson and you see this lone figure and it's george washington and the smoke clears and george washington is still on his steed and he hasn't moved and he hasn't been hit or damaged at all and at the very end 
the dream changes, the, the face of George Washington becomes the face of Donald Trump. Wow. wow. And again, a lot of people have a problem. If, if you're going to be in intelligence, if you're going to, if you want to hear what God is saying through dreams, through visions, through things, one of the core values that we have is we're not afraid of information. So if if something like that triggers you, you need to ask why, because you, you need to be ready for what's going to happen this year. And what if God wants to bring Donald Trump back? What if Donald Trump is somebody that God has chosen for this hour to be able to fix the institutions that are hurting our children? What if that's the case? And what if you're not on board because you have a father wound or you don't like the guy, mm -hmm. he's a loud mouth, he sends bad tweets or whatever it is that triggers you about his hair or his mannerisms? Can you get over that? And can you seek God and say, God, what are you, I'm not even trying to convince you that he's the guy. There's a lot of people that are like, he's the guy and he's God's chosen. He, all I would say, because if I try to convince you and then you run into some difficulty later, then you're going to blame me or you're going to say, well, I just disregard everything that Redenbow guy says. What I'm trying to say is ask God. I'm not afraid of information. So go to God and say, what do you say of Donald Trump? What do you say of this man? And forget everything you've ever heard, everything good and everything bad, and say, God, what do you say? Like for this election, people, we need a clean slate in America. There's so much corruption. There's so much in the church. It's coming out in the church, let alone Wall Street, the financial institution, the pharmaceutical companies, the elect, everything is pervasive with corruption and, and and stuff that we cannot, the way forward is not the way we've been. We cannot continue down this path right. because we have criminals running pretty much every institution of the church, the government, the medical community, Wall Street, and everything else. And so unless we want to be herded into camps by criminals and give our country entirely over to them, which is not the goal, it's not God's will, and it's not what most of us want for America, then we have to change. And the way that we can change is ask God. If you're afraid to ask God if Donald Trump, who, who what he says of Donald Trump, then that is going to reveal that there are some things in you, conversations you probably need to have with God particularly about father wounds, particularly about pastor wounds, potentially about leader wounds. But if you can't ask that question, and it's okay if you can't, God accepts you wherever you are, ask this, God, what do you say of our nation? And who is the person to lead us to that place? Do we want a place where our can kids our kids can grow up without the fear of being kidnapped? Man, I used to I used to get on my bike and ride to another state. We lived in Toledo, Ohio, not only five miles away from Michigan. And I would take off at six or seven o'clock at night and ride my bike up into Michigan. When I was like 13 years old, I go ride 20 miles and come back and never had a thought of being taken or kidnapped or <laughs> carrying a gun or anything like that. People used to play out in their front yard all the time without fear. Mm -hmm. And and now there's so many things that we don't want our kids out of our sight. We don't even trust them in the public school system or in yeah. college or because there's so much, many things. Is this, is this the nation that we signed up for? Is yeah. this what we want? And if it isn't, who cares about the children? Who cares about the children enough to say, I'm going to risk all of my political capital, but I want the children saved. And guys, we've been through tough times because we've had idiot leaders, frankly, if I can just talk plainly, that have made dumb financial decisions, that have made dumb international and foreign relations decisions, that have blown the credibility of this nation, that have entered into stupid treaties, that have sold out and been bought and paid for and compromised and manipulated and blackmailed into literally selling our country out from underneath us. What if we had one person that maybe the only thing they ran on because we've survived all those times. What if we had one person that said, no matter what happens, we're going to save the children and we're going to rescue the, as Diana said, potentially 40 million or whatever the number is. I don't care if it's a million. I don't care if it's a hundred thousand. These kids deserve to be rescued. And what if we had somebody that said, this is what I'm going to dedicate my presidency to. Guys, we can't be any worse than what we've already been through. <laughs> We, we we literally can't and we've survived this and we've literally survived 
pretty much what a fe- appears like zero leadership at the helm, zero level of credible leadership. And we've lost all credibility in the world in certain areas because of the leaders that we allegedly have chosen. <laughs> but what would it look like if we had a dad which we do have a dad. We have a father God that loves mm-hmm. us, that cares about us, that cares enough to challenge us, that cares enough to speak the truth to us, that cares enough to have tough conversations. What would what would it look like if we had a pastor like that, like in the first part of Ash's dream? Instead of the second part where there are covert people, they say they're Christians, mm-hmm. but the only thing they want you to do is to drink their sauce. And their sauce seems to be clear And it seems like it's better than the brown bottle that the other guy had, but it's not. It appears to be clear, but it's clearly poison. And what they want is they want your demise. They want to destroy generations. They want to take out the father and take out the son. And they're people that are wolves in sheep's clothing. And and, uh, I think the choice is is, is really clear. But are we fighting against true accountability in our lives? What about true accountability in the prophetic? What about true accountability in the prayer movements? What about true accountability mm-hmm. in any church movement at all, period? What what about true, what does that look like? And who are the leaders that we can trust to come in and give us the hard information that we need to literally break down the door? Like we talked about last time, the Corey Asbury song, no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down. <laughs> coming after me what if god wants Mm -hmm. to rescue this nation and what if and i'm not saying he is just listen because it's less offensive to ask a question than to make a statement Mm -hmm. what if god wants to use donald john trump to do that and what if there's something in you that believes a lie that won't allow you to vote for him or support him or get behind him why don't you hear from god and get the will of god as we enter into the election season, we're full blown into it now. And as we get closer and closer to the election, this is not this is not an advertisement for a candidate. I want you to hear what I'm saying. I want you to hear the word of God. This is a powerful dream. <clears throat> the dad is dead, poisoned by a pastor who wants to take out the son as well. That if you realize what these symbols mean. The pastor represents spiritual leadership, the idea of clarity. They're selling clarity and they're saying, here's a bottle of clarity. It's not clarity, it's poison. They're saying things that are diverting people away. And what's ending up is is confusion, which can result in spiritual death, but it can also result in physical death. There wasn't a time that long ago where if you listen to somebody that was supposedly trusted, that generations have trusted these type of people for years, and you did what they would say, you actually were at more risk of death than if you didn't do what they said. Hear what I'm saying. This can happen spiritually, and this can happen in the future of our nation. And our nation, we are in the valley of decision in the year of 2024. Everybody talks about it's an open door in 24, and we want more in 24. And all of that's great. You have to realize an open door requires something of you. An open door is a decision. Yes. And the decision is, are you going to step into it or not? And what if you see somebody on the other side that looks like a dad that hurt you when you were a kid or looks like a pastor that you can't stand or has the same mannerisms of somebody else that you got hurt and you haven't been willing to forgive. And because of that, you can't walk through the double open door that God has for you in 2024. I believe God wants to restore this nation. I believe God wants to bring healing to our land. I believe God wants to continue to shut the mouth of liars, to expose the corruption. Yes, in the church. Yes, in the political realm. Yes, in every sphere of society. He wants to do it now. He wants to do it this year. And we cannot stand in the way of our own lenses or our own hurts and wounds and say, that person's bad because there's a bias in myself. Can you lay yourself on the altar at the throne of God and say, I submit my will to yours, and I want to know what you require of me in this election year, what you want me to get behind, how you want me to vote, 
And beyond that, how I can position myself and how even I can pray. You realize you may not be praying for the right person because you have a wound or a bias. Yeah. And what you're really doing is you're really having that broken heart that Ash had in the dream where you're wailing inside Mm -hmm. and you're crying out, dad, 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 Mm -hmm. because we haven't seen what a father looks like in this generation in a long time. We've been let down by so many people and it is what it is, but it's not God. Do not judge God by your view of a father or a pastor or a leader or the leader of a movement that's failed you. That is not God. God has for you the pure love and the righteous acceptance of somebody that loves you without question, unequivocally, that will help you clean up any mess that you've ever created. And there's nothing you can do that he won't accept you back. That's the kind of father that we need. And that's the kind of measured response that we're going to need as this exposure happens. Guys, I'm here to tell you the hard truth that when people are exposed, they have a right to be restored. According to the Bible, they have the right to go through a process and be restored. We don't just line them up and have our way. We don't take out every, yes, there is judgment and there is justice, but the heart of God at the end of the day is restoration. (laughs) And, and again, I feel like there's so many of these themes that are coming through in this dream. It's the generation crying out, and it's the sons and daughters of God being revealed. Sons and daughters, fully grown, become mothers and fathers. That's what we need in this generation. Many teachers, the Bible says, but very few fathers. And I love how God pulled Ash into an emotional journey with this dream, with the announcement of his dad is dead and now we're trying to kill him and a pastor. And there's so many things I can't even imagine that will probably conflict it in your heart. Do I even share this dream? What does this say of clergy? What does this say of, you know, what people don't even want to speak this stuff, but what it, what this is, is this is the unvarnished truth of God laying bare the hearts of a generation that's crying out for fathers that have been so disappointed that they may not even accept a father if God himself showed up. And we can't be that way. We have to pray for exposure. We have to pray for justice and Mm -hmm. we have to pray for the heart of God for our nation. Amen, John. Well said. All right. Um, Ash, I can't believe how fast our time goes. Ash, I would like to hear any comments you have about this dream. Um, So first of all, wow. Um, first of all, I, I had we said this before, like before we even pressed record, we were talking about having topics of conversations like this that are just a group of people in the body of Christ coming together and expressing what they see, what they receive, what they hear, and they're the. It's not just even an opinion; it's the clear facts. And is the a deciphering that goes on through this, a decoding that goes on through this, whether it's through dreams or words uh, or past experiences. Mm. I am really trying hard to keep this together. There are so many people that have just been delivered and freed from this veil of lie and hurt and deceit. And I don't find it coincidental at all that John shared the testimony of that woman sharing her dream about the, a very, very close encounter with the wrong father, the way that her perception of the dream was and her emotion towards the dream was. But yet she got it mixed up. She didn't understand. So there was a miscommunication mm-hmm. in that. But in this world, we've all been lied to. And it's the lie that has not just come from the father of lies, but has come down through, like we said, institutions where we're meant and we've been taught and trained to follow and trust and find security and safety in that. And I really do, I I just know, I know there were people when John said about the altar, There were people that were coming down. Their souls, their hearts were coming down from the stairs where I was sat. 
And they were coming downstairs to the real father that was there. And he wasn't mm -hmm. holding a false bottle. There wasn't any poison there. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a false congregation or a group in the lounge trying to tidy up and make it look like they're doing works mm -hmm. of doing the right thing. There literally was a father there, like the father of the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. Knowing that this son had been deceived, his heart, his own heart has been deceived, the wants of the world, the attractions of the world, and yet only at rock bottom, like John said, was that moment where it's either despair or it's anger. And he decided mm -hmm. to go back to the father. And in this conversation that we've had today, I feel there were so many people, even that would profess and say, well, there was nothing wrong with me. I'm in the body of Christ. You know, I, I'm, I believe in the spirit and all these things. Yet there was deliverance that was had this day. And I am yeah. so honored, so honored just to be part of it. Just to, just to be here with you, both of you and everybody watching this. Mm. Let alone be a person that had the dream that is part of delivering this, this revelation. And more importantly, that has brought these people to be brave enough to come to the altar and ask for cleansing, ask for yes. deliverance, ask for the Father's heart and know what they've been fed and what they've been drunk and given to in the bottle has been a lie and they're now choosing to seek the real Father, the true I am, the great I am. Yes. Man, talk about exposing like my defensive walls. I'm telling you. He'll do this. He'll do this. And it doesn't matter what has happened to you. And I'm, I will, you might have been the father or the mother that might have done something to a precious lamb. It might have been your own child. But you did it because you had it done to you. And you're no different than that child. You can go to the father just like John said, you can go and ask for forgiveness. You're not going to be lined up against the wall and shot religion will tell us taught us to do that but the father won't do that mm -hmm. and yeah there is going to be exposure yes there might be punishment yes it's gonna hurt but there's a healing there's a cleansing there's a, a process of this where you are redeemed because the father's will is that none should perish That's none right. so i really felt that i had to share that with you guys uh, i'm sorry i'm a bit of a hot mess Oh, um, <laughs> well, no, no, I've never apologized for zeal and emotion and depth of feeling. That's who our God is. That's why he gives dreams like he does. He has massive emotions uh, that he's not afraid of. And when we let Holy Spirit hoover over our emotions, they can be very beneficial as well. <laughs> But yeah, I just see that again, everything that John said, everything that Diana said in regards to the decoding of this, the clear bottle. And I also got this as well is um, the end from the beginning. So the two, the split scenes. So you've got the first scene, which really was the second scene. Okay. So the first second scene was really the first scene. So you're going back to the future. I know we mentioned this previously, but you are. The second scene is really what happened first. Mm -hmm. And because of that, later on in life, the cause is this reaction in the first scene of the man being at the door, drinking, being wow. a defensive with the brown bottle, but then being offensive with the, with the pistol. Mm. And he's choosing also, which is amazing that John has done this, is he's choosing to, he, when he pulled it out of his pocket, he's looked at it and he could have quite easily pointed it towards himself. But it's because he saw the light and knew there was someone and heard the bang out oh, I'm going to point it at this person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on the offensive with this person, which a pastor is willing to take the shots. Mm. Jesus is willing to take all your hurt, mm -hmm. all of it, every single bit of it. He'll take it. He'll take the crying. He'll take the shouting. He'll take the aggression. He'll take all of it. So he has all of you. So you don't have mm -hmm. to carry this anymore. And you can, you can complain, you can sit on the floor and go, why did you break my door down? He's willing, like John said, leave the 99 to come and find the one. And he does it every time, every mm -hmm. single time where you think there is no rescue, there is no hope, there's, you've, you're too far gone. Or oh, the things that have happened to you are just too far deep, you can't get out. 
And I guarantee you, I'm sure Joseph felt the same way when he was in that hole where his brothers left him in. And then he was sold. But then he was blessed. He was anointed. He was promoted and then knocked down again. But then anointed and promoted and blessed and was in charge of a whole nation. Literally, a man that thought he was a god, he stood at the right hand of that false god. And was in charge of a whole nation and world because the world went to him yeah. for help. Will you, brothers and sisters, from your brokenness, become the light mm -hmm. on the hill? Mm -hmm. And will you shine? Will you be that car like that went through someone else's top window mm -hmm. and be willing to bang on the door? And if they're not willing to open the door, to punch your hand through it, grab the shoulder that's hurting and say, mm -hmm. I am here with you because he that is in me is greater than he that has destroyed and hurt you in that dark mm -hmm. place. Yeah. That's the question we've got to ask ourselves. Because I can share personally, the more I help people, the more I invest myself in helping other people, the more I'm fixed. The yeah. more I'm healed. Okay. So I just, I have to share that. But thank you so much, guys. What a blessing. What a blessing. Well, thank you so much for coming on and just being so open, sharing your dream with us. And John, your expertise is so valued. Thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been a blessing just to be with both of you. Um, and I'm, I think let's, yeah, was there anything else you wanted to say, John? Uh, before we end here, or we can just have Ash pray us out. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I always talk so much, but I, <laughs> I, this was an emotional, um, from our conversation before, I did not think we were going to go this way, but, no, uh, no. <laughs> but uh, I, I feel like this really touched the heart of God yeah. for the nation and for a lot of people. Yes. And I want you to know that it, like what Ash said and what Diana has said so well, that if you are a prodigal, there's hope. Come home. Yes. If you are a parent that is praying for your son or daughter or grandson or daughter, don't don't give up. Um, if God forbid you are a person that has lost a child or that's had a child kidnapped or killed, or I have too many friends that have experienced things like that. Or if you've lost a loved one recently, or if your dad isn't around and there's no way to redeem with that physical person that was your father, I want you to know that there's hope. And that there is, you still have a heart and a soul that is crying out for fatherhood. And no matter what you've been through, God can be that father for you. And God can redeem the times and he can redeem the pain and the trauma that you've been through. And as a country, this has to happen in order for us to heal. We have to go through difficult things of showing us the poison and the exposure and the hurt and the pain, dealing with the emotions and the lenses and the pushback and the weak boundaries and the gun and all of these things that these represent, which is acting out because of pain and trauma. And we have to allow God to show us all of that to deal with it righteously, to bring justice and restore justice, and then to bring healing and restoration to our land. And I believe yeah. that this is probably not the only year, but this is going to be a year that is going to mark the world. But in particular, I believe it's going to mark America because there are things that are going to happen where God is going to move on our behalf and what may be really, really hard to see and experience is the only way that we get to the healing. We can't brush it over and pretend like it never occurred. Yeah. There's been too much of that for too long. Yes. We have to be faced with it, but then we have to encounter the matchless, incredible, overwhelming, <laughs> never ending, reckless <laughs> love of God that meets yes. us in that place and that comforts us and shows us what love looks like, what fatherhood should be, what righteous leadership should be, what a pastor should be, what a leader should be what people that we can trust can be because that is the future of our nation and that is the mm. way forward and that's what god has for us i believe that with all my heart mm. amen john beautiful um and i do believe that the remnant the army of light we have already awoken to a lot of the poison and and so we've already gone through a lot of that trauma but that's so that we can help the ones who come behind us and say, hey, there's hope, there's healing, there's good things in the future. 
for this nation, for your life and your family, for the body of Christ. Um, it's just, we have a good, good God, and he's coming to rescue us. All right, Ash, would you close us out in prayer, please? Yes, of course. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you. Holy Spirit, I, ha I just thank you, Lord, for being amongst us today and for all the brothers and sisters that watch this whenever like lord i just thank you for your mercy your grace your protection your revelation but your love lord whether that comes in through truth breaking down walls harsh realities or strengthening lord there was so much information and so much of your presence and, and your heart in this conversation today and i just I just want to give all glory and honor to you, Lord, because I know you're able to minister to every broken heart that watches and listens mm -hmm. to this broadcast, every single one. Mm -hmm. And you're willing to break through those doors, those barriers, any mess, and cleanse out spiritually and physically any poisons, any tra trauma, any mm -hmm. physical ailments that have been left behind by broken other people or darkness in the spirit. You cleanse it all. You heal it all. You wash it all away white as snow and you give us new garments. Yes. So, Lord, I ask you just to bless every person's heart, mm -hmm. their soul, Lord, yes. and let the body glow, glow you, your love, and let it be radiant, Lord, so it just shines through so others truly see their brothers and sisters or even strangers in this dark time, let them see the flames above their heads, like in the upper room, Lord. So when the world is in chaos and is broken and hurt and screaming and crying and don't know which way to turn, left or right, they will see the flames above your children's head. Mm -hmm. So they know, the ones wandering in the wilderness, they know to run straight, not to the left, not to the right, but straight. And I thank you, Lord, for this blessing. I thank you, Lord, for this healing. I thank you, Lord, for this deliverance sermon today. And it's in such an unusual way, a new way, Lord, that you're doing this. But you are setting the captives free because as well as those children and those in trafficking right now, the world has been in a slave system and you are setting us free. Oh, you goodness. are giving us this exodus moment. We give this victory, this glorious exodus moment, yes. this liberation to you, Lord. Yes. And I give you all the honor, glory, and praise, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Wow. That was powerful, Ash. Thank you. Thank you, audience. Thank you for hanging in there with us, joining us, uh, joining your hearts with ours. We feel that. And we send our love and our blessings to you. And we will be back again. Bye for now.